Ave Maria, the following program discusses adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. Good evening. You know, speakers often tell their audiences, and they usually tell their audiences how glad they are to be there. And in my case, that's actually true. <laughs> and I want you to understand that in telling you so, I'm not merely engaging in a ritual of false politeness. For some years, I've earnestly wanted to thank you. And today, I have the chance. The reason why I've so long, so earnestly desired this opportunity is that you stand in a way that no others do for the noble, despised virtue of chastity. And I am so grateful to you. No doubt, like everyone who nourishes the flame of hope in a culture that has lost its hope. You have both victories and defeats. Yet, you hope. The evidence is that you're here. And so, whether you know it, whether you're always conscious of it or not, you encourage everyone who does hope more, much more than you know. Thank you. These days, we're all expected to hurl ourselves into every sort of temptation, like moths hurling themselves into the flames. You've made a different choice. I would guess that you suffer some cost for refusing to suffer that cost. For as you and I both know, the popular culture would like to cast you in a different role, wouldn't it? It wants to make you icons of its own hopelessness and hedonism. But you reject that role. Thank you. You're not forgotten. You cannot be forgotten. God knows each of you by name. I don't know each of you by name. I'm just another person with his own temptation. Some days it is all I can do to remember my own name. <laughs> But I know that I speak for millions of other fallen humans when I say, thank you for bearing that witness. Thank you for holding up that light. I hope to be a person of courage, too. That sounded like the end of a talk, not the beginning, didn't it? <laughs> so I think I'd better get started tonight. <laughs> Tonight, I'd like to speak with you about why there is sex. Why is there sex? I'm not going to talk chiefly about same-sex attractions. That, you know, there will be a few mentions of this, but I'm going to try to present the big picture, the vision which has to be seen if same-sex attraction is to be understood. But I'd like to begin by reading to you from a letter that a young woman sent me some years ago. She was responding to some things that I had, that I had written, mostly for young people, on the subject of sexuality in general, uh, same-sex attraction in particular, because some of what I wrote was, re was uh, online responses to things that readers had emailed to me, challenges, questions. It was a long letter, but I'm condensing a little. This is, these are her words. I am not a Christian, but I'm writing to tell you that you're right, and I was wrong. I am 20 years old, and since age 13, I have been 
lesbian identified. What this means is that while I was never actually involved with a woman, I was fluent in the language of gay culture. I had gay friends. I attended gay pride parades in San Francisco. And I had a hidden but extensive library containing everything from the classic gay novels to lesbian pornography. In the summer of 1999, two very important things happened. The first was that I lost my virginity to a man with the support and encouragement of my mother, who thought that it would cure me. I kept my hands over my face the entire time, and I didn't feel particularly healthy afterward. The second was that I became seriously ill. It turns out that these two events were not connected, though at first I feared they might be. Afterward, she says, I was bedridden for a year, and during that time I discovered your writing. An emotional battle began that has lasted almost two years, and I'm finally throwing in the towel. Why? Let me share with you three random events from my life. She said, one, I received a phone call from my friend. She called to tell me that her girlfriend has decided to have her breasts surgically removed. Two, I visited the website of a lesbian magazine and found an article on how to use needles as an aid to sexual pleasure. The author recommends having benzalkonium chloride towelettes on hand to wipe up the blood. Three, a straight female friend emailed me from college. I was, I was very uh, impressed with the fact that the disorders that she was speaking of were is clearly affecting her <coughs> heterosexual friends too. The friend was asking for advice, returning to quotation. Here is an excerpt. I have suddenly become sexually brazen. It scares me a little. I think that it's about time that I stop giving myself guilt trips about it. But the people I meet end up leaving. I can't help but feel that some or a lot of this is a little empty. My correspondent concluded, when women want to cut off their female organs, when hurting each other with needles is considered a turn on, when promiscuous girls feel guilty about feeling guilty, something has gone terribly, terribly awry. I've been a faithful reader of yours. I've been hopping mad at you more times than I can count. The funny thing is I keep coming back, keep telling the truth, and I'll keep, letting, uh, keep, <laughs> keep uh, listening. Yeah, that letter broke my heart. Now, I know that some of the things that she describes are rather extreme, but, um, but they tell us something about the sexual culture of our day. Brothers and sisters, that isn't what my generation expected when it invented the sexual revolution. The game isn't fun anymore, even some of the die-hard proponents of that enslaving liberation have begun to show signs of fatigue and confusion. Naomi Wolf, for instance, in her book Promiscuities, reports that when she lost her own virginity at age 15, there was, quote, something important missing. What is that something important that was missing? Well, she doesn't say, but reading between the lines, it's not difficult to figure out. The thing that was missing was apparently the very sense that anything could be important. In her book, Last Night in Paradise, Katie Roifa poignantly wonders what could be wrong with what she calls freedom. She titles the book Last Night in Paradise because she's worried about the end of the sexual revolution. Things just seem to be coming apart. She says, what could be wrong with it? She says, it's not the absence of rules exactly, the dizzying sense that we can do whatever we want, but the sudden realization that nothing we do matters. Desperate to find a way to make it matter, some young men, um, uh, a minority, but some young men deliberately court to death, especially seeking out sexual partners with deadly infections as, as, um, as partners. Now, at the opposite extreme, though, some who languish in the shadow of the sexual revolution toy with the idea of abstinence, but not the abstinence of which we speak here at Courage, rather an abstinence that arises less from the vision of purity than from boredom, fear, and disgust. In Hollywood, of all places, it's become fashionable to talk up Buddhism, which is a doctrine that finds the cure of suffering in the ending of all desire, and the cure of desire in personal annihilation. Speaking of annihilation, speaking of exhaustion, let me tell you about my students. 
I'm speaking here mostly of students whose desires are aimed at the opposite sex, but if I suggested in class in the 80s that there might be a problem with sexual liberation, they said everything was fine. What was I talking about? Now if I raise questions, many of them speak differently. And it's an interesting thing. They still live like libertines. They still sometimes talk like libertines, but it's, it's getting old. It's getting old. They're beginning to sound like the children of third generation Maoists. <laughs> My generation may have ordered the sexual revolution, but theirs is paying the price for the meal. And I'm not speaking only of the medical price. I, yeah, I get. I don't know about you. I get so tired when I go to uh, I go to and I hear speakers who are trying to persuade young people to be to be chaste, and they talk all they talk. The whole talk is about disease and about and about uh, unwanted pregnancies and so forth. Uh, to be sure, that price of the medical price is ruinous. But I'm not speaking only of broken bodies. I'm speaking of, for example, broken childhoods. What is it like for your family to break up because dad's found somebody new? What is it like for you, this, your family to break up again because this time mom has? What is it like to be passed from step-parent to step-parent to step-parent? Well, too many of us know. What is it like to grow up knowing another aspect of our culture that you would have had a sister, but she was aborted? A young man remarked in one of my classes that he longed to get married and to stay married to the same woman forever, but because his own parents hadn't been able to man manage it, he was afraid to get married at all. He respected them. It was an odd sort of inversion of what should have resulted from respecting his parents. Because he didn't want to think ill of them, he believed he couldn't possibly manage what they hadn't been able to manage. Women show signs of avoidance of uh, relationships too, but in a more conflicted way, according to a survey commissioned by the Independent Women's Forum. 83% of college women say marriage is a very important goal to them. It's a very high percentage. Yet 40% of them engage in hooking up, and we know what that is, physical encounters, commonly oral sex, without any expectation of any relationship whatsoever. Do you hear a little cognitive dissonance there? Do you hear a little cognitive dissonance? Can you think of any sexual behavior less likely to get you into marriage? The ideology of hooking up says that sex is merely release or recreation. You have some friends for friendship. You have other friends just for hooking up. And uh, what your body does is supposed to be unrelated to what your heart is up to. I think we'd better not believe that. The same survey reports among these young women that hooking up commonly takes place when both participants, this is by their own report, when both participants are either drinking or drunk. And it's not hard to guess the reason why. After a certain amount of this, you may need to get drunk to go through with it. It's just too hard. It's just too hard. And this is what we call liberation. The fact is that we're not designed for this sort of thing. Our hearts and our bodies are designed to work together. Our hearts and our bodies are designed to work together. Truly, don't we already know that? I'm speaking of men and women both. A woman may be more likely to cry the next morning, a man, but a man pays a price too. Out in the culture, most men, I think, think that they can instrumentalize their relationships. In other words, treat their partners as tools and yet remain capable of romantic intimacy when the right person comes along. And I want to say to them, sorry, <laughs> that's not how it works. Sex is like applying adhesive tape. Promiscuity is like ripping it off again. If you rip it off, rip it off, and rip it off, eventually the tape can't stick anymore at all. The ruin of the adhesive probably contributes to an even wider social problem that might be called the Peter Pan syndrome. I thought I was very original when I gave it that name, and then I discovered that a lot of other people had been calling it the same thing. Well, that happens. But, uh, you know, men in their 40s, with maybe children in their 20s, talk like boys in their teens. I spoke to one young, uh, one, young one, one such man in an airport terminal. We were both waiting for an airplane. And uh, he said, I still don't feel like a grown-up in his 40s. They don't even call themselves men just maybe guys. Now, in a roundabout sort of way, I've just introduced the concept of natural law. 
I don't know if you noticed, the natural law tradition is unfamiliar to most people today, but it's been the main axis of Western ethical thought for the last 23 centuries. And in fact, it is experiencing a sort of a modest renaissance. Uh, the hinge concept is meaning and design, natural meaning, natural design. I said that we're not designed for heart-free relationships. We're not designed for hooking up, that we're designed for our bodies and hearts to work together, which implies that there is some spiritual significance to the very matter of the body, doesn't it? And I mean the term design in the broadest sense, not merely mechanical design, this part goes here, that part goes there, but what kind of being we are, what kind of being we are made to be. Because the design is not merely biological, but also emotionally, emotional and intellectual and spiritual. For that reason, the languages of natural law, natural design, natural meanings, and natural purposes are pretty much interchangeable. Some way, the idea is that some ways of living comport with our design, and some ways of living don't. Now, from a natural law perspective, then, you know, taking a big picture, a big broad view of this situation, the problem with 21st century Western sexuality is that it flouts the embedded principles and the inbuilt meanings of the human sexual design. A doctor might, if he were speaking to you, might highlight the medical consequences of flouting the design. A natural law philosopher like me will probably highlight the emotional, intellectual, and spiritual consequences of flouting the design. But these two sides of human sexuality are interwoven, and they have to be viewed as they are. Well, all right then, if I'm going to talk about purposes and meanings that are embedded in the human sexual design, then I had better say something about what they are. What are the sexual powers for? What are they for? Leaving aside the sacramental meaning and considering only the two, the natural meanings, there are two. There are two. One is procreation, the bringing about and nurture of new life, the formation of families in which children have moms and dads. The other is union, which means not just feeling close, but it means the mutual and total self-giving and acceptance of two polar complementary selves in their entirety, soul and body. These two meanings, the procreative and the unitive, are so tightly stitched together by nature, by how we are made, that we can start with either one of them and follow the threads to the other. Now, before I go on to explain these two purposes, you might ask, but why just these two purposes? If I ask my students, well, what, are the, what is the purpose of the sexual powers? They'll say, why, pleasure. Of course, the purpose is pleasure. There is no other purpose. Certainly, sex is pleasurable, but there's nothing distinctive about that. In various ways and in various degrees, the exercise of every voluntary power that we have is pleasurable. It's pleasurable to eat food. I enjoy it a little more than I should. <laughs> it's pleasurable to breathe. <sighs> it's pleasurable to flex the muscles of the leg. The problem is that eating is pleasurable even if I am eating too much. Breathing is pleasurable even if I'm sniffing glue. Flexing the muscles of my leg is pleasurable even if I'm kicking the dog. And what this shows is that to know when it is good to enjoy each pleasure, we have to look beyond the fact that it is a pleasure. In other words, the pleasure is not the purpose. It's a result. Suppose we were to say that since eating is pleasurable, the purpose of eating must, must be pleasure. Well, certain ancient Romans are said to have thought this way. To prolong the meaning of their feasts, they purged between courses and then returned to the table and ate some more. I hope it's not difficult to recognize that such behavior is disordered. The more general point that I'm trying to make is that although we do find pleasure in exercising our sexual powers, pleasure's not their purpose. It only provides a motive for using them, 
a dangerous motive which may sometimes conflict with their true purposes and meanings and steer us wrong. Our bodies are not just tools for sending agreeable sensations to our minds. They are of infinitely greater dignity than that. For that is, for they are part of what we are. Now I was saying, before this little digression about pleasure, that the two purposes or meanings of sex are procreation and union. And it isn't very difficult to see that one of them is procreation, is it? Apart from the fact that sex does in fact bring about uh, human life when between two people of opposite sex, it would be difficult to understand why we are endowed with sexual powers at all, why there would be any reason for us to have them. But if the procreative meaning of sex is granted, if we admit, well, yes, yes, that is part of what it's all about, what it's for, well, then the unitive meaning follows. You really can't say yes to one and no to the other because we aren't like guppies who cooperate only for a moment. For us, procreation requires an enduring partnership between two beings. The mother and the father, the husband and the wife, who are different, but in ways that enable them to complete and balance each other. Nothing like that does happen among the guppies. Nothing like that happens among the paramecia or among the, fro the, the bacteria or, or, the, or, the, um, or, the, uh, or the funguses. Union, then, is a property of the distinctly human mode of procreation. A parent of each sex is necessary to make the child because the female provides the egg. The male fer fertilizes it, the female incubates the resulting zygote. A parent of each sex is necessary to raise the child because the male is better suited to protection, the female to nurture. I realize that, that, uh, that the blood of a sacred cow is now on the carpet, but, but um, <laughs> I'm hoping that if I slip and fall, you'll, you'll help me get up. Uh, a parent of each sex is necessary to teach the child because he needs a, a model of his own sex, he needs a model of the other sex, and he needs a model of the relationship between them. Mom and dad are jointly irreplaceable. They're jointly irreplaceable. In fact, their partnership and procreation continues even after the kids are grown. Even after the kids are grown and they are no longer at the procreative age because the biologically procreative age because grown kids need the help and counsel of their parents to establish their own new families. So procreation is a multi-generational activity. Plainly then, the gift of the spouses to each other is at the center of our procreative design. The more you think about this mutual gift of self, right, actually the more astonishing it is. It's really very surprising. It's um, unexpected. It's, you might almost say, peculiar. New human life could have been brought about without sex, as in yeast and amoebas it is. Uh, it might have been brought about with sex, but without the gift of self as in those guppies that I mentioned. But it isn't. For us, not apart from the potentiality for new life, but because of the potentiality for new life, sex carries within it another potentiality for a powerful and distinct form of human love, which can, however, be misguided. This is why it shakes us to the core. This is why it says, now you will never be the same. Whenever the spouses give themselves to each other sexually, they're doing something that cannot help but mean that happy chance of new life, even if that isn't their intention. They can't change the objective meaning of the act. They can't change the procreative meaning of the act because a bodily action is like a word. We mean things to each other not only by what we say, but even more by what we do. In fact, think about it, when the speech of the body let me turn it around. When the speech of the mouth contradicts the speech of the body, when I'm saying this is what this means, but my body is saying something else, which speech wins? The speech of the body does, not the speech of the mouth. If I crush your windpipe with my thumbs, I'm saying to you by my action, now die. Even if I tell you with my mouth, be alive. To join in one flesh is to say, I give myself to you. 
in all that this act means, even the possibility of new life, even if my mouth shapes the words, this means nothing, do you see where this leads? For two persons to give themselves to each other totally is to give themselves in what they totally are. What they are totally, what they are wholly, includes their bodies. And into these bodies is written the potentiality to bring a third person into being. It's part of what they give and receive. And this is why the, 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 the sexual act is inherently an act which involves both of the polar and complementary opposites. Now, let me explore another part of this mystery. What makes this gift, this mutual gift of two selves to each other possible? What makes it possible in the first place? Well, it wouldn't be possible unless they had something to give. It wouldn't be possible unless they had something to give, but what do I mean by that? I mean that there is something missing in the man which is more fully present in women. And there is something missing in the woman which is more fully present in the man. By themselves, each one is incomplete. To be a whole, they have to be united. Uh, paradoxically, this incompleteness is a blessing. Because first, it makes it possible for them to give, to e give themselves to each other. And second, because it gives them a motive for giving themselves to each other. The gift of self makes each self to the other self what no other self can be. The fact that they forsake all others is not just a sentimental feature of Western traditional marriage vows, but it arises from the nature of the gift. You can't partly give yourself because yourself is indivisible. The only way to give yourself is to give yourself entirely. Because the gift is total, and because it joins the very flesh that makes us different people, it excludes all others. If it doesn't exclude all others, then the gift hasn't taken place. John Paul II spoke of how powerful this is. The body is the visible sign by which the invisible self is actually made present and communes. The body is an emblem of the person, and the joining of bodies emblematizes the joining of the persons. One flesh unity is the body's language for one life unity. Nothing else that we do with our bodies is like this. It's a very strange thing. In the case of every other biological power, only one body is required to do the job. A person can breathe by himself, using no other lungs and diaphragm but his own. A person can circulate blood by himself using no other heart but his own. So it is with every one of the vital functions except for one. And that one exception is procreation. If we were speaking of breathing, it would be as though the woman had the diaphragm and the man had the lungs, and they had to come together to, come to take a single breath. If we were speaking of circulation, it would be as though the man had the right atrium and ventricle and the woman had the left atrium and ventricle, and they had to come together to make a single beat. Now, it isn't like that with the respiratory or circulatory powers, but that is precisely how it is with the procreative powers. You know, we like to say, well, there's the male, repro there's the male uh, reproductive system, there's the female reproductive system. That's completely incorrect. Neither one has a reproductive system. Each one has half of one. <laughs> but they have opposite halves. The union of complementary opposites is the only possible realization of their procreative potential. Unless they come together as one flesh, you might say as a single organism, though with two personalities, procreation doesn't occur. How strange and how mystifying that two such divided and incomplete beings have to come together. Why would God create an ontological gap between the two sexes? And you know, it's a funny thing. That ontological gap is not experienced only by those 
who deal with same-sex attractions. The ontological gap between the sexes is experienced by, by people whose desire is for the opposite sex, too. Men are in, a many, in many ways strange to women, and women are in many ways strange to men. Why would God create such an ontological gap between the two sexes, considering that it takes such effort to bridge it? Why would he do that? Why didn't he just create one complete sex that combined all the male and female qualities instead of two incomplete sexes who need to balance and compensate for each other? You would almost think that he had designed us the way he did just so that we would have that difficulty to deal with. Wait a moment. Could it be, in a way, that that's true? Could there be something good about having this difficulty to deal with and to overcome? I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes. The division and incompleteness of the two sexes is a blessing. It is a blessing. How could it be a blessing to be incomplete? Well, one reason is because it makes it possible for two persons to complement each other. You can't give someone what he already has. You can only truly give what he doesn't have. So men and women in general, and the husband and wife in particular, have to be different from each other, and different in just such a way that they balance, each providing what the other lacks. It's surprising. You would think that the ontological gap would make the communion of two different versions of human being impossible. And actually, it is the very thing that makes the sexual communion of two human beings possible. The second reason why the division and incompleteness of the sexes is a blessing is that it provides a motive for the two sexes to cross that ontological gap. Feeling their incompleteness, feeling their incompleteness, the two sexes tend to long for each other. And of course, there are other ways to use the sexual powers. We all know this. There are other ways to dissipate that longing. There are ways that fail to bridge that canyon. Uh, And that is true in uh, heterosexual relationships as well. Promiscuity fails to bridge the canyon. Autoerotic behavior fails to bridge that canyon. Um, One of these kinds of things sinks me still more deeply into myself. Another might attach me to something that is more like my reflection. Still another way would reduce other persons to being my tools. None of these ways would help me to climb out of the deep brick-lined well of myself. And in fact, each of these ways makes that steep, makes the steep walls of that well even steeper. By contrast, the union of two opposite sexes draws a person to forget himself and care and sacrifice for someone who is truly and strangely other. You might say that in this experience, people come to themselves by losing themselves. And although it isn't my topic tonight, I might add that Revelation says even more about this mystery. It describes the crossing of that ontological gap as a foretaste of the crossing of the even wider ontological gap between man and God. It's not for nothing that faith is described, that the faith describes heaven as a wedding feast. Now we now come to a difficulty. And I have no doubt that many of you have been thinking about this difficulty. What about persons, like some of us in this room, who are called to a chaste single life? Or what if, like some of us, you are a priest or a member of a religious order who has taken a vow of perpetual virginity? More to the point of this annual gathering of courage apostolate, what if you just don't have feelings of attraction to the opposite sex? (coughs) And you think it unlikely that you ever will. I hope that I haven't caused inadvertent pain. But it may seem as though all this time I've been describing a box of chocolates that you can't have. No. There are two things wrong with this box of forbidden chocolates picture. The first is that it paints sexual purity incorrectly. The second is that it paints sexual, uh, sexuality itself incorrectly. The true picture is much more wonderful. 
So let me take each of these two errors in turn. First then, why does the Forbidden Chocolates picture paint sexual purity incorrectly? Because it pictures purity as though it were merely negative. A no or a not, lacking any character of its own. Don't take those chocolates. Now it's true that continent singles, chaste singles, say no to something, obviously. It is true that there is something that they don't do. They abstain from sexual intercourse. But singles who have really grasped the virtue of purity aren't just not doing something. They are doing something. By living as they do, they are pursuing goods of beauty and integrity that impurity undermines and sullies. Here's a comparison that may help, I hope so. Chaste married couples say no to something too, don't they? There is something which they too don't do. They abstain from unfaithfulness. Yet would any sane person say, well, there are some voices today that say this, but, but it seems insane. Would any sane person say that faithfulness is a limitation to marriage? That it impairs marriage? Of course not. That would be like saying that avoiding false notes limits melody. Avoiding false notes doesn't limit melody. It is the very thing that makes melody possible. Faithfulness doesn't limit marriage. It is the very thing that makes marriage possible. Now there's the point that I want to make. Continence in the single life is like this too. Chastity does not limit singleness. It is the very thing that makes the dignity of the single calling possible. The single estate is another mode of life different from marriage, true, but capable of its own kind of integrity, an integrity to which continence belongs in exactly the same way that faithfulness belongs to the integrity of marriage. By practicing continence, single persons can see the things that God has created in their true loveliness instead of through an obscuring haze of desire. By practicing continence, they can keep from being jerked around by their passions. By practicing continence, they can have the inner freedom to live as St. Paul urged when he wrote, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now what I've just been saying was to explain why the Forbidden Chocolates picture paints sexual purity incorrectly. It's not a negative. It's a positive. Remember, though, I also said that it presents sexuality itself incorrectly. This truth is even more beautiful than the last one. And here again, the culture lies to us. The culture lies to us. It tells us that if we are chaste, if we are continent, if we are sexually pure, then we are being false to our sexuality. We are repressing ourselves. We are turning ourselves into neuters. This is not even remotely true. Our sexuality is a permanent part of our human nature. Consider so many of our highest models of manhood and woman, womanhood, though, are celibate. Was Blessed John Paul II less a man because he did not have sexual intercourse? Was Blessed Teresa of Calcutta less a woman? Did either of them give the impression of feeling deprived by not having a box of chocolates? Continence did not neuter them. It intensified them. How could that be? Here's the answer. Having sexual intercourse is what human beings do to procreate, but having sexual intercourse is not the meaning of being sexual the meaning of being masculine and feminine. Consider first a woman. A woman is someone who is in potentiality for, I try to avoid uh, multi-syllable words whenever I'm giving a talk, but I trust that I'm speaking to intelligent people and you know that I can't avoid it in this case. Um, a woman is someone who is in potentiality for motherhood. 
As Alice von Hildebrand puts it, even though not every woman is called to marry and to bear physical children, she says, I'm quoting, every woman, whether married or unmarried, is called upon to be a biological, psychological, or spiritual mother. A woman knows intuitively, von Hildebrand insists, the profound importance of caring for others, of suffering with and for them, for maternity involves suffering. This is a profound insight, and it belongs to the genius of womanhood. It was a woman who spoke for all creation, and as a virgin, when she said to God's messenger, let it be unto me, as you have said. Now, if you'll allow me to build on this line of reasoning, then I'll suggest that just as a woman is someone who is a potentiality for motherhood, a man is someone who is in potentiality for fatherhood. Just as motherhood is broader than, broader than biological motherhood, so fatherhood is broader than biological fatherhood. Just as not all women are called to marry and bear children, so not all men are called to marry and sire physical children. Yet just as not all women are called to mother, just as all women are called to motherhood in a larger sense, so all men are called to fatherhood in a larger sense, every one of you in this room. For men, growing up is like joining a brotherhood of fathers. This is one of the reasons why the brotherhood and the mutual help in this organization is so important. Our grasp on this fact is attenuated by the fact that the culture has lost its rights and customs of apprenticeship and coming of age and this sort of thing, and by the fact that so many of us today have grown up without fathers or with impaired relationships to our fathers. And yet men naturally desire to be something like, well, like knights, really, who not only do hard things, but in firm and fatherly fashion, train others so that they can learn to do hard things too. A man will more readily aspire to manhood if he can taste the flavor of valor. If all goes well, then this is true not only of how he carries himself toward other men valorously, but of how he carries himself toward women, because a knight is also a guardian. I spoke earlier of the genius of mo womanhood. This is the, of, of motherhood. This is the genius of manhood, of fatherhood, in the broad sense. Now, just as biological mothers and fathers, when all goes well, specialize in and exemplify different aspects of wisdom to their children, different aspects of it, so men and women in the world at large specialize in and exemplify different aspects of women to the world at large. A woman knows intuitively that in order to be strong, you must love. A man knows intuitively that in order to love, you must be strong. She knows that even boldness needs humility. He knows that even humility needs to be bold. He is a living emblem of that justice which is tempered by mercy. She is an animate symbol of that mercy which is tempered by justice. To her, sexual purity presents itself as a treasure to be protected. To him, it is less likely to strike him that way, but it presents itself as a quest to be undertaken. For as you see, it's one of those hard things that we were talking about. So we may say that men and women share a royal calling. Women are called to be the queens of creation under God. Men are called to be the kings. All of this concerns sexuality. Of course, all of this concerns sexuality, just in the sense that a queen is different than a king, and a king is different than a queen. All of this concerns sexuality, but none of it requires having sex. Why, then, is there sex? Why, then, have we human beings been divided into two different kinds? The answer is a paradox. We were divided into two so that we could learn to make a more perfect whole than if there were only one. We were divided into two in order that we could learn to make a perfect, more perfect whole than if we were only one. This is not just a truth for married persons. It is a truth for all persons, for the married and faithful in one way, for the single and chaste in another. Each sex must learn to give encouragement to the other, to express solidarity with the other. How many colors, how many more colors there are in the world because there are two sexes and not just one? 
how much more dull this meeting would be if there were only men here or only women here. How much more music there is, because there are two kinds of us, how much more tang I expect men and women to remain baffling to each other. Yet even their mutual perplexity can be a fountain of mirth, making the shimmering hues of strangeness sparkle all the more. No matter to which state of life we're called, if we can delight in this fact, if we can make merry in it, if we can enjoy being, at times, even mutually ridiculous, then all of us together can turn more joyfully to God. People today do so much to kill joy, don't they, that you would think that they don't want it. Don't believe it. They do want joy. All humans do. That is why, in the long run, the sexual revolution has no future. We are put together in such a way that although we can be pushed and pulled and drowsied by the flickering images of joyless desire, we cannot be satisfied by them. We know too much, even in oblivion. Fallow knowledge troubles our sleep. We lie under the prickling enchantment of the law written on our hearts, which is stronger than the counterspell and can never be quite scratched out. The way and the life lie with the truth. So brothers and sisters, let's walk in it together. Thank you.